Hello and welcome to Big Deal. I'm Nisha Podar. Now, market regulator SEBI has recently amended the norms governing promoted disclosures of listed companies. Listing obligation and disclosure requirements or LODR has been amended on the aspects affecting the management and control of listed companies to include all binding and non-binding agreements by the promoter's family and it also entails material rights of the investors and any agreement between them. These are supposed to be disclosed by 31st of July to the listed companies. Now, as the deadline nears, how prepared are the companies as well as the shareholders and promoters to comply with this? And what is the impact of this development? Let's find out from two experts joining me today on Big Deal, Cyril Shroff and Dinesh Kanabar. Gentlemen, welcome to CNBC TV 18. Cyril Shroff, beginning with you, what is the broad intent of this amendment? So uh, just to pick up from uh, where you left, uh, Nisha, I think what has happened is that the SEBI LODR uh, regulations have been amended and the amendments are now already in effect from 14th of July. And whilst it cover a number of topics, uh, the, the points relevant for today is two particular clauses, uh, which is Regulation 30A and 31B. Regulation 30A deals with uh, disclosures of agreements at the shareholders level, whether it is uh, promoters, it could be even other investors as well, related parties and others. So basically the ownership class that sits above a listed company. Uh, and 31B relates to, to sort of special rights. So the intent, I think, as expressed by SEBI itself is twofold. One is to bring greater transparency so that the public shareholders uh, who may or may not be aware of these arrangements are specifically made aware because this would then be in the public domain. Uh, and implicit in that is to reduce uh, the so-called information asymmetry. And they may be in uh, recent cases, not exactly relevant to families, but which may have prompted this. Um, I think the Amazon future dispute was probably one of the reasons which may have prompted this. Uh, SEBI had put out two consultation papers uh, in November 2022 and February 2023 indicating the intent of why they uh, want to bring about these changes. So it is broadly in the direction of improving governance in public markets by enhancing uh, the level of, uh, of disclosures. And the interesting thing is that these disclosures apply even if the company is not a party to these arrangements. Hmm. Could be purely private uh, uh, arrangements, family constitutions, family agreements, family understandings. All of that has now been brought into the net. That's right. And more uh, disclosures, more transparency, and also to contain information asymmetry. That has been, uh, you know, the path that the regulator SEBI has been taking through various measures. Dinesh Kanabar, how is the industry really taking it at the moment? What's the feedback coming in from the companies as well as the promoters and the investors for complying to this? Uh, and the deadline given is also very short. So two parts to that question, Nisha. First of all, we need to recognize that while in some sense this requirement is new, there was already an existing requirement which basically said that all shareholders' agreements, family agreements, etc., which were binding and which were uh, uh, not in the ordinary course of business were required to be disclosed. So as, as it is listed, companies had that obligation. But the two primary conditions was that they had to be binding. And second, they had to be not in the ordinary course of business. Then they were required to be disclosed. Now we need to go back and look several, several years back to go back and say that here are arrangements. And now again, the requirement, as Cyril rightly explained, is far, far broader. So any requirement which could impact management, which could impact control, which could impact restrictions or pose restrictions on the company, or which could sort of put any liability on the company, which is far, far broader than what currently existed, are now required to be disclosed. And therefore, companies need to go back and look at the arrangements they have entered into. So let's say, for example, as Cyril rightly mentioned, we are talking about shareholder level things. But if, for example, there are two brothers, as, as an example, and they have parted ways, 
and there are territorial rights carved out or there are business rights which are carved out which earlier may have been taken to be in the ordinary course of business now you need to revisit and again look at two words which have been put out earlier it was binding now whether it is binding or non binding earlier it was if it was not in the ordinary course of business i had to make a disclosure now there is no such requirement so companies need to re evaluate several of the things that have been entered into past they could have been entered several years back um, as i said territorial rights business rights uh, uh, again now kmps have been covered so for example uh, if apart from esop there are other things which have been committed to kmps so in essence nisha what we are seeing is companies go back and look at several of these arrangements between themselves between directors kmps etc and the key words again binding non binding whether or not in the ordinary course of business and again whether it impacts management control imposes restrictions company can or cannot do something or any liability you know the word liability is a very very broad word so all the agreements which are pending need to be evaluated in the light of this and therefore one needs to start now making a call of what is required to be disclosed and one is doing that one needs to be conscious that if these agreements were entered way back in the past was a valid decision made or a judgment call made at that point of time that this was not disclosed because it was um, not in the ordinary course of business etc so uh, we we see several of the companies promoters shareholders go back and look at variety of this and come back to say here are the agreements which earlier were not disclosed now they need to be disclosed and obviously then there is an issue on what is the impact of that on the company its performance or its market price and all of that right uh, so very important comments there dinesh kanawa taking off from there cyril shroff two important aspects that i picked up the key words and of course is uh, open to interpretation and is it well understood and defined in your view legally one is non binding agreements also come into the fold of these disclosures now and second something which is not in the ordinary course of business also needs to be disclosed is the definition now clear and by way of this in the private space whatever agreement has been really uh, you know done bit by the family members or the promoters or the investors or the private equity investors all of that comes into the fold of disclosures now yes i think uh, there is a lot of ambiguity on several of the expressions i mean pun is on purpose and effect binding non binding all of these uh, expressions will uh, need to be defined what is uh, material impact on management and control these are uh, areas which are up for determination and i think there is another angle which i think uh, dinesh bhai partly adverted to is that even if these are private arrangements Um, you know, sometimes nobody except the family members know about it. They're probably sitting in, you know, the chairman's uh, home, uh, 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 and and nobody in the company knows about it. How is the company ever going to find out uh, about this? And uh, the the thrust of these regulations casts the burden on the corporate entity. So there is a lot of ambiguity also in terms of what is the impact of this and who is going to suffer the consequences. Is it the company that is going to suffer the consequences, or is it the shareholders? They are not saying so, but uh, does it mean that these arrangements are unenforceable? Uh, and if so, uh, why, why, you know, would that not be an overreach to say that private arrangements, which are otherwise perfectly enforceable amongst the parties, will not be enforceable just because you didn't disclose them? So there is all these, uh, you know, gray areas on the on the frontiers of where. kind of the laws relating to public markets meets the uh, private domain because a lot of these things are part of the promoter's private wealth it is relating to the arrangements relating to their private domain what is succession for example uh, the the succession may be a very secret topic that is dealt with in uh, in a family constitution or some other arrangement does it need to be disclosed the breadth of the regulation seems to suggest that everything if there is an arrangement on it needs to be disclosed so i think part of what corporate uh, india particularly the owner class needs to consider is whether this is a overreach of why public markets uh, into the private domain 
That's right. Uh, in fact, you raised a lot of points and ambiguity and gray area, and I'm sure this will really evolve, but a clarity coming in from the regulator or the experts and a consensus being built on that is going to be very important as part and parcel of the evolution of this new compliance burden. Dinesh Kanabar, you mentioned that some of the agreements which could have been reached by the family constitution, family agreements, even non-binding in nature, way back and whether it holds true right now or not. But whatever was there and is existing as of today needs to be disclosed to the companies by the end of this month and the company needs to disclose it to the uh, exchanges in a few days from there. So how do you see this? Are the promoters going back to the drawing board and um, you know making concretizing some of these agreements which were made way back? You know, uh, it's actually a very, very interesting question, Nisha, and uh, I go back to what uh, Cyril mentioned earlier. So, if there are private arrangements which the company is not aware of, now the promoters are required to disclose it to the company by 31st July, and company in turn is required to disclose it to the regulators by 31st of August. So, apart from the fact that the window is uh, very low, but a, a, a number of questions which again, um, uh, I'm sure councils will sort of look at from time to time as to how does SEBI reach out or extend its ambit to promoters, private arrangements, etc. Does it have a right to do so? Does it not have a right to do so? And again, what happens if these are not disclosed to the company because company may not be aware or a party to any of these. Uh, this, uh, otherwise, they would have been built into the articles of association. I'm presuming that none of this has happened thus far, otherwise they would already, already be in the public domain. So if these are not disclosed to the company, and therefore the company is unable to disclose it to the regulators, what happens to those agreements? Coming to the specific question, uh, yes, every promoter group will now need to go back. And the reason why this becomes very, very cumbersome, onerous, and a lot of gray area around is that some of this might be pure internal to the family. So let's assume that there is a family comprising of a number of members and there are a number of businesses. Um, there are so many groups, uh, um, uh, particularly in the South, which have well-defined family constitution going back generations and there are several people in the business. And all that the family constitution provides is the process of consultation between family members. Now you need to go back and interpret as to whether this has an impact on management control liabilities or restrictions on the company. And that may not be a very easy take. So for example, if family members have taken charge of specific areas of business, all they need to do is that if there is a material capital expenditure, they need to go to the family board and have a discussion. Now, is that a restriction, not a restriction? Does it impact control? Does it impact management? These are not easy questions to go by. And again, Cyril made a point in a different context to say, that this is sort of a private domain and public domain encroaching on each other. And therefore, to make that call is not an easy call, but it is obligatory upon all companies, listed companies, to go back to the drawing board. And remember here again, the reach of this particular amendment extends not only to a listed company, but things happening with holding companies, subsidiary companies, so we are looking at a fairly broad thing. So yes. if, for example, there is a listed company, there is a subsidiary beneath, and the subsidiary has got agree agreements which are of that nature, they need to go back. We are looking at also directors, we are looking at KMPs, and then therefore the, broad, the breadth is enormous, yes. and the area of grey only goes on increasing. All right. Uh, so what I've understood is that there are some ambiguities and who bears the burden of non-disclosure of this norm also, whether the company or the shareholder, the promoter, investor, that's also one big question that needs to be addressed. But I would say in my understanding, what SEBI and market regulator is trying to really address is the timing of the uh, dissemination of a classified inf uh, information 
regarding the impact on a car listed company by the promoters or the shareholders. So they time the public disclosure while SEBI wants an immediate disclosure so that the investors can really take note and cognizance of that, especially in the cases of uh, either a sale, acquisition, as well as succession and many other material developments. That's my understanding. But we'll slip into a short breather on Big Deal and we'll continue the discussion on what's going to be the impact of these disclosures and more compliance. That's after a very short break. Stay tuned to Big Day. Welcome back. You're watching Big Deal and we are discussing uh, the nuts and bolts, the compliance burden as well as the impact of SEBI's new regulations on promoter disclosures. Now, Dinesh Kanabar, you were talking about the various aspects, but what has been the impact, the unintended impact of this particular norm? So, two parts again, Anisha. First is, this is a step, welcome step, because far too many disputes have arisen where listed companies have gone back and said that there is a particular dispute which has arisen, which has a material impact on the valuation of the company. Cyril made a mention about uh, the Amazon future dispute, which is very much there in the public domain. And the question was, there was an agreement or corporate agreement uh, in terms of if there were certain restrictions which were put on the company. And no such disclosures were made. And therefore, the... And could, could one have argued that those were in the ordinary course of business and therefore disclosure not made? I don't know. And therefore, the expansion of 30A is a welcome step. Uh, uh, we had discussed earlier, Nisha, that this is consistent with requirements in several other countries, whether it is USA, whether it is Canada, whether it is Australia, elsewhere. So the need for promoters to be upfront and talk about what is happening in the company and let the public market investors be aware rather than making a call themselves and not doing something and then later on such arrangements come to light and then the question is whether necessary approvals from shareholders were taken or not taken i think is a very very welcome step a larger transparency is indeed welcome and if we are doing something which for example sec has enforced on the listed companies in us etc we are moving in the right direction Right. Yeah. The question which comes up is number one: Is are the provisions very defined, and are are they vague? Number two: Is there a regulatory overreach? At the end of the day, you are talking also on the one hand, while you are talking of transparency, you are also talking about ease of doing business. 
And if you are talking about such a broad range of things which are not defined, whether it is management, control, or whether it is liability, whether it is restriction, what does all of this mean? Where does it stop? And therefore, the question is that if the smallest disclosures are required to be made, which even a recipient may not even be able to understand and appreciate, what, where does that take us? Are we only increasing the cost of compliance burden? Are we doing um, uh, disclosures for the heck of it? Can there be a better definition? And I think that's what is very, very important, mm. that rather than leave such an important aspect, a necessary aspect, way, if it is better defined, well defined, materiality is well defined and all of that happens, right. then this is very, very welcome. Today, the unintended consequences that people have to make calls themselves. Right. When you start making those calls, you don't know where to land. And finally, I think the very important aspect is what is the consequence? If a company is not aware of something, is therefore unable to disclose it, does that mean contracts are as Cyril was saying, enforceable, not enforceable? We have no such clarity on any of it. All right, lots of clarity required. So, uh, Cyril Shroff, what should the shareholders and promoters do now? when things are unclear at the moment and the compliance burden is so huge. And my other question is, what is the way we are taking with these uh, norms being amended? What is the direction that SEBI is taking, really? Yeah, so uh, as, uh, as our clients are asking us in terms of what to do, I think the first thing that needs to be done, and preferably at an industry level, is to go back to SEBI and say, look, this is the consequence of what you have done. There could be some unintended consequences. There are portions of which which require clarity or may need to be rolled back because there is this element of where some of the things are crossing into the, uh, into the private domain. Yes, there has been consultation uh, already uh, before the regulations were brought out, but uh, I think uh, the implications of some of this are, are profound. And I know we didn't get a chance to talk adequately about 31B, which is not about disclosure, but it is about uh, sort of reconfirmation of special rights every five years. Uh, that has profound uh, implications as well, not only on families, but also on private equity investors and joint venture partners. The, the general understanding in any market is that once these rights have been blessed by the shareholders upfront, they're blessed for life. You don't need to refresh them every five years. So if we were to tell private equity investors, for example, that your rights are up for uh, refreshing and renewal by a special resolution every five years, uh, there will be a very strong reaction from them uh, in terms of, you know, do I really have these rights or not? And yes. then you'll have to start thinking about they may want to exit. Uh, because yes. if these rights don't continue, why should I continue? I'll be out of here. Right. Uh, so very important points made there. So a lot of things still unclear, but the direction that uh, market regulator is taking is the transparency as per gold standards, which is also complied with in uh, the global markets like US, UK, Canada. So that is the attempt, but whether it increases the compliance burden and more ambiguity, that needs to be seen and some of those clarifications needed. Thank you so much, Cyril Shroff and Dinesh Kanabar for joining us on this discussion. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of Big Deal. Thanks so much for tuning in.